All right, now we're ready to go. All right, week number two. We've already talked about the basics of engines. We at least can picture what kind of engine we're talking about, I hope. The basic theory of engines. And now we can get down into kind of the nitty gritty about overhauling or working on engines. So we already talked about this little bit out of AC 4313 that said specifically something to the effect of, specifically the effect of that, so it does too. Um, let's see. Engines, did that particular make, but. Uh, this section lists acceptable inspection repair procedures that may be used in the absence of an engine manufacturer's maintenance information. So we determined that can we use 4313 as a basis for inspections or maintenance on an engine? Yes. 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 But it's like the last resort. The last resort. It can be nothing else. The manufacturer has to be 100% silent before you can go to this. You cannot go to this first and go, well, yeah, that's close enough. All right. So what do we want to talk about here? Uh, let's talk about the use of data. So we can start off with, well, so this is the proper use of data. This is where you will get yourself into big, big, big trouble. Everybody makes a mistake. And it seems to me like the world is somewhat forgiving of mistakes, not always. The FAA seems to be somewhat forgiving of mistakes. And they want to know right off the bat, was this a mistake that anybody could have made? And they've really gone in my career from going to, if you make a mistake, we're going to punish you. That'll teach you to not make mistakes. To a, an attitude of, if a mechanic on the floor makes a mistake, that probably speaks to a culture from upstairs coming down that made that mistake happen. So they seem to be turning more from the mechanic that made the mistake and looking back up towards the supervisory and why do you have a culture that allowed this to happen? Because if the culture is such that we have an attitude of zero mistakes and an attitude of we're going to do it right, an attitude of we're going to use checks and balances and proper inspections and turnovers, then that shouldn't have happened. And if it did, was it an attitude problem coming down or was it an attitude problem here or was it a procedural problem? Procedural problems are fixable. Nobody needs to be punished. You just need to figure it out and do a procedural change, which we learned a lot or should have learned when we talked about the dirty dozen. Um, so I guess the point I want to make with all that is that I know I certainly view it as, and I believe the FA does too, although I don't speak for them, if you're not using the proper data, that's more of a choice not to. Because in order to have an A&P certificate, you've been taught to use the right data. So if you're not using the right data, is it, what's he saying? You can't or you won't. You ever heard that one? If you can't, I'll teach you. If you won't, I'll beat you. Oh, I'm not beating anybody. I'll be my own butt beat. But so anyway, <clears throat> we want to make sure that we are using proper data. And I get on it's just a soapboxy thing. I just know there are still people out there in the field working who just have this, the rules are fantastic for you people. They just don't apply this way. It's to keep you idiots in line. I'm much smarter than that, so this stuff really doesn't apply to me. And I know, I'm not saying about me, I just, trust me. Um, <clears throat> what's his nuts? Uh, what's his nuts is exactly the person. Ask the, <laughs> ask the AMPs guy. Mm -mm. No, 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 he's, I was thinking of somebody local. <clears throat> for, all right, so hierarchy of data, hierarchy. Hierarchy of data. I think you guys already know all this. Uh, what is the first thing we're going to look for when we're using data to work on something? Manufacturer release data such as maintenance manuals. Let's be very general. What is it called? Public maintenance manuals, publications. Oh. Approved yeah. data. What's what's the other? What's what's below approved data? Acceptable. There you go. So we'll get to acceptable in a second. Okay. Now you can tell me what is approved data. Manufacturers, maintenance, overhaul, whatever. Maintenance or overhaul, whatever they're going to call it. Manual. <clears throat> well, in the Lycoming, we have the, what is, what is your manual? The overhaul manual. 
the Lightcoming Direct Drive Engine Overhaul Manual. Um, what else do we have? Airworthiness directives. Airworthiness directives, absolutely. ADs are technically federal law, written into Part 39. ADs, airworthiness directives. Okay, we got service bulletins, letters. Or service letters, or I say instructions. Uh, Lycoming uses service bulletins, letters, and instructions. Letters are more like, and you can tell when they're old because they all start out gentlemen. So these don't apply to you. You don't have to do them. So <laughs> clearly is not addressed to me. I didn't have to do it. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, I'm not a gentleman. I am kind of, <laughs> yes, it wouldn't apply to you either. So anyway, but the, you'd see a lot of them, you know, we are introducing a new type of oil or we would like to announce that you know, it's something like that. It's like not usually, you know, or hey, we're going to have a price increase. This is a service. It's not critical to the It's office. not. It's usually a product thing. Okay, then we get into service instructions. Um, as you're finding out, service instructions are, wow, they're big. Just like your, how do you torque that case together? Service instruction 1029 Delta? Yep. Okay, that's a big deal, right? So that's really something. It's how to do something. Um, well, they're, they're this thick, literally. Um, so it could be anything, you know. Uh, when I told you that the camshafts went from having a, uh, you could, camshafts went from this to when you bought them and you had to, the gear was separate to now it's a one piece deal. You can't take the gear off, right? So when they did that, they came out with a service instruction that said converting engines from a two piece camshaft to an integral camshaft. And you had to drill a hole somewhere for safety wire and, and do that kind of stuff. Uh, bulletins tend to be a little bit more, uh, especially with light combing. Hey, we got a problem here. So instructions tell you how to do something. Bulletins are, you're about to see an AD. Or we're doing this because we don't want an AD. Uh, crankshafts had the gears coming off the back of them. Well, that became a service bulletin uh, because you had to do it a very specific way. It was uh, very important to them. So service bulletins, letters, definitely. And I know I've mentioned before that front page of the Lightcoming Direct Drive Engine Overhaul Manual says that that manual is only considered a complete and total manual when you use service, service bulletins and instructions along with it. So service bulletin, you'd say, is like the next step before AD. It usually is. And a lot of times an AD will just make the service bulletin mandatory. <coughs> Are service bulletins and instructions mandatory? Yes. Boy, that's a loaded question. And I shouldn't have asked it. Um, it's a very complicated thing because the rule is an owner operator under part 91, which is just general operating flight rules, not for hire. The rule is you do not have to comply with service bulletins. So Cessna comes out with a service bulletin. It says, hey, we want everybody to install this inertia seat rail lock thing on the bottom of the seats and we're going to uh, warranty it. You can bring your airplane to do it for free. Do I have to do it? No, no, no. I do not because I'm not for hire. It's my choice. Uh, there's no denying that. Nobody argues that one. All right, I've got a light combing engine and the, um, the, the crankshaft thing, how to, how to put the crankshaft gear on and there were some bad bolts and they wanted you to do it a very certain way. Do I have to comply with that service bulletin? Yeah. No, but you should. Not should. I'm going to go a little bit out this way, be a sort of controversial and say, yes, you have to. Why? Because the overhaul manual says that. Uh, all, 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 all right. So you kind of see that little line right there. <clears throat> overhaul manual says that the overhaul manual is only considered a complete manual when used with bulletins and instructions. So there's that kind of, kind of a bit of a get you there. So Nobody's coming really to knock on anybody's door. Choose to ignore a service bulletin because then you can't fully do the overhaul. Yeah, well, on an overhaul, I would say you have to do that bulletin, right? So but if it was a, it, now, Lycoming would call this a service instruction, you see. That's kind of the difference in Lycoming. And you got to just be, once you're in the industry, do I have to do a one-piece camshaft? No. 
I call Aircraft Specialty Services, a company I think they're still in business. I used to use them all the time. I liked them. And I say, hey, I don't want this new one-piece crankshaft. Do you have any two-piece still in stock? Yeah, we do. Well, I want it. Fine. I'll sell it to you. Is that legal? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I can do that. So service instruction didn't say I had to. Uh, bulletin kind of does. All right, that's a little muddy, and maybe if you didn't quite get that, I just want to keep exposing you to this so that eventually you're like, okay, I think I got this. Um, let's see. Bulletin. So um, I know it was confusing because I said like the bulletin on the Cessna because that's how Cessna does stuff. In Cessna, you have the maintenance manuals. Then you have bulletins pretty much, which are like, hey, you should consider doing this. Then there's ADs, which say, we're telling you how to do it now. And there'll usually be an AD that says do the bulletin. All right. Um, let's see. Um, oh, before I move on to that, manufacturer's uh, manual. Which manual? So uh, I have a 1977 Cessna. What manual do I use? And let's just and let's just say Cessna has the latest revision that just came out in 2020. They didn't, but let's just say. You can use the manual that it came off the line. That's correct. I think I mentioned that before. Should I? No. no I think you'd have a hard time in a court of law if, if a, an attorney said, so which manual did you use exactly? Well, I happen to know that this is the latest manual. How come you didn't want to use the latest manual? Oh, are you kidding? That subscription is 7000 bucks a year, man. All right. Uh, maybe not the best argument. All right. What else we have here? Uh, type certificate data sheet. I wrote FARs, but I'm not going to put that because it's not how to do maintenance. Um, okay, so those are approved data, so we can do stuff with that. Um, you got it? Am I missing STCs? anything? Sure. What's an STC? Supplemental type. It's a supplement to the type certificate. So what would be a supplement to the type certificate on an engine? Yeah. On an engine. You can use a different uh, grade of gasoline. There you go. Uh, you... You, automotive gasoline by Cessna 150 had an STC that the previous owner had bought and uh, it came with a piece of paper and a little band that went around the oil filler neck and for those two items and I don't know what it's like a buck per horsepower or something like that uh, you have the right to put Chevron gas in your car or whatever yeah you can also um, for engines you were mentioning for your 182 uh Cylinders, your cylinders. Yep, yep. Change out my 470 cylinders to 520. That'd be a supplement type certificate. Adding an uh, oil adapter for some of them. Changing pistons in the Lycoming uh, 320 series. You can go from 150 to 160 horsepower by changing out the pistons. So there's a lot of things out there. All approved. Did you use an STC for the, for the upgraded air filter you did? Or you... Yes. Yeah. Bracket air filters and STC. All right. Acceptable data. What's acceptable? 4313. Right, that's the only one I could think of. AC 43.13, and only when no other info is available. All right, got that out of the way. How do you know if you have the most current manual? <laughs> nope. Call the manufacturer. There you go. Manufacturers are reasonably helpful. Do not call them and be an idiot, as Dwight would say. <clears throat> was it this class who was people trying to call the battery? company no no, no, that was, that was, that was, that was. yeah don't do that shit <laughs> when you call them you had better know your shit i can't say shit on the radio can I? you what what kind of information should you have right in front of you when you call them serial, your tail serial number serial tail number, number hours. part number hours since major overhaul total time at a minimum you should have every one of those things Every, every detail you can think of, right there. Yeah, if you call up and go, yeah, I've got like this engine in a Cessna. Well, what kind of engine? It's gold. It's <laughs> kind of big. <laughs> I think it has six cylinders. I could be wrong. Maybe five. I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm calling for it. All right, steps to an overhaul. 
steps of an overhaul. This is all review for you guys. Right out of FAR, which makes it federal law. 43.2, A1 and 2. What are the steps of an overhaul? Disassembly. Hang on, A, B, C, D, E, and F. We must fill them out in order. First is what? Disassembly. Disassemble. Next is? Cleaning. Next? Inspection. Well, I, I would, inspection be prior to cleaning. <clears throat> in the manual, it said to don't clean the parts before you inspect them because sometimes, sometimes. You are correct. Work. These are the steps in order for the FAR. However, when, yeah, when does your inspection start? Disassembly. It starts right here before A. And where does it go from there? Yeah, and so inspect actually goes from here to here. <laughs> you never, s you start with it, you never stop. What comes after inspect on the list? Repair and replace. Repair as necessary. Then. Assembly. Then the most important one. I'll use your words, testing to approved standards. What if there are no standards? Then you better look again. <laughs> well, let's just say I want to overhaul a connecting rod. Where in the book does it say how to test it? Because you got to test it to approve standards, right? So I can tell you right now, there's no testing. You measure it. So how do you overhaul it? You do. I would say you don't. Don't use that word. Don't say you overhauled it. That'll get you in trouble. <clears throat> what did you do? You disassembled, clean, inspect, or repaired as necessary, and you reassembled by installing a new bushing and inspecting this per service instruction. I forget the name and blah, 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 and you leave out the word overhaul. <clears throat> In the aviation world, we have three color tags that are most common. You have red, which means it's on sale. Uh, <laughs> you have red tag sale. It means it's bad. It should be scrapped, junk, right? It's done. It's don't, you don't fix it. Red tag is gone. And then you have green. Green means? Good. Good. No, not good. Not good. Green means? You can repair it. It's repairable. Oh, I should have another color. Um, yellow means repaired. it's been overhauled or repaired and is returned to service. Tan means it's usually just identifying tag. Tan. Just, just happens to be tan. So green means repairable. repairable. Yellow, which means caution. The rest of the world means repaired. you're good to go. It is ready to go. All right. All right, so that's all a review from 309, correct? Yes. Yeah. All right, shouldn't have any questions on that. If you do, throw them out now. So in the repair station world, the funny part is our work orders are way more than work orders. They have statements on there. We sign them as inspectors. And it actually has a return to service statement on the work order. And then on a part, so like if I, somebody brought in six of these and one of these overhauled, because that's the word they're going to use, I would say fine, <clears throat> knock out the bushing, put in, a, a disassemble, clean, inspect, which would include NDT testing, um, twisting convergence before I take it apart, uh, put in a new bushing, ream the bushing, inspect the, the big end. There's a service instruction on like coming big ends. Um, do the magnetic particle, I say put in the bushing. Yeah, put in the bushing. It's done. Clean it, wrap it, tag it. Put what color tag on it? Yellow. yellow tag. And the yellow tag will just have like what some of the work that was done and reference a work order. The work order has all the parts on it, a statement of what I did, disassemble, clean, inspected, a magnetic particle inspected, uh, six connecting rods, reinstalled new bushings, uh, cut to size, um, 
return to service statement. And people will take those yellow tags and just so carefully laminate them and put them in a book and take their invoice and go, yeah, pay that, poosh. And that was the invoice that really had all the statements on it. So <clears throat> uh, let's see, definitions and abbreviations. Sometimes people get their undergarments wound up and shoved up pretty tight about using abbreviations in aviation. There are some that say that you should not use any abbreviations unless it's in uh, FAR part. Right, one, <laughs> definitions and abbreviations. So, but we tend to use a lot of abbreviations in aviation that are accepted industry-wide that I don't think are in part one definitions and abbreviations. So we'll talk about that. Um, we've already talked about, this is not an abbreviation, overhaul versus rebuilt. That's uh, under FAR 43.2. What is the dif difference between an overhaul and rebuilt? Everything is the same except for the testing. So, uh, new or serviceable one is limits. new and one is serviceable. Which one is which? Uh, rebuilt is new, overhaul is serviceable. That is correct. And if you're a manufacturer, you can say whatever you want. That's for you manufacturer. So overhaul is to serviceable limits. New or serviceable, like with your engine, obviously there's more than one or two things to measure. Let's say every single thing on there was new and one thing was serviceable. Serviceable. Then the engine is... E overhaul. No, overhaul. Then it's not... Yeah, then it, and it's got to be overhaul. What about rebuilt? Full new limits. Is to new limits. Tested to the same tolerance and limits as a new item using either new parts or old parts that have been oversized or undersized appropriately. So all the fits and clearances are new tolerances. Is there any problem with putting an overhaul part in an engine aside, aside the fact that maybe you could get more life out of it if it was rebuilt? Like say a crank, for instance? Not at all. No. The, the theory is when the manufacturer made the components and they said, okay, you're going to overhaul it, and you're going to use serviceable limits in their engineering data, they're assuming that, let's say you get everything was to the worst end of serviceable limits. I mean, it's right at the end, but it was still serviceable. That should run all the way to TBO again. Overall, overall, next overhaul. Should. No guarantees. No guarantees of any of it. Why is this still up? TBO, one of those approved abbreviations? Yep, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, let's see. We'll throw this one out here. So, all right, so we're good with that. What about a uh, reconditioned? What is that? Does that mean it's been like, like, the, like the camshaft you're talking about where it's, no, I'm wrong. <laughs> what is reconditioned? Is that Outside the one? Outside of serviceable limits, but we were able to turn it down back to, to a new undersized service? Means any damn thing you want it to, because it's not defined. Means <laughs> <laughs> we washed it. Washed it, yep. <laughs> Washed it. You take a piston pin and you clean it and then you put it on the lathe and you polish it. You reconditioned There you go, you reconditioned it. <laughs> don't use yeah, don't use that word. Um don't use oh man. Oh that's actually my next thing. So overhaul oops, overhaul. Overhaul. What is that right? Major alteration. Major alteration. This is a question. The overhaul. Is it a major alteration, a major repair, or not? Which would make it a minor alteration or a minor repair. It's a major. It's a minor, right? Minor. It's a minor repair. Yeah. It's so, and it's called a major overhaul, by the way. It's, uh, it's so is a major overhaul a major I repair? You said it wasn't. No. Huh? I thought you said it wasn't either one. When did I say that? Last week. Well, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> These guys don't remember stuff from last week. Why you remember stuff from last week? <laughs> you're, you're not fixing anything. You're just returning it to. I don't know. You said. You said. Haven't you said in the past that 
there's no such thing as a major overhaul. It's just overhaul is uh, just across the board. Yes. All right. There are conditions when a major overhaul is considered a major repair. If you take off the supercharger, right? That's one. Not if you take off the supercharger, but you're very close. Well, if it, All right. If it had one, software, it was built with one. Internal. So I'll write that down. So one. So remember that um, uh, FAR 43 appendix. What? Right. A. <laughs> <laughs> List major alterations and repairs. So two, unless the engine has an internal supercharger Okay, what's an internal supercharger? What kind of engine would have that? Radial. Radials, I'm one I know about. A radial. So it's got an internal supercharger. You can't see it from the outside. So unless the engine has an internal supercharger or reduction gear that is not a spur type gear. Spur type gear is two gears. One gear, another gear, that's it. So the crankshaft comes off here, you got a gear, then you got another gear on top, it goes out the prop, that'd be a spur gear. One, two gear. So like a GO300, the, uh, the Gitsu 520 engines, Continentals, all your flat opposed engines, they're just spur gear. But what is not spur gear? Your big radials. Look at the radial we have, the 13... The, the double wasp. Yeah, yeah. that has a sun, a sun and planet gear system in it, which we'll talk about at a different point. So that is definitely a... Internal supercharger. That is an internal supercharger, and it also has... A gear reduction. Gear yeah, reduction. yeah, that is other than spur type. So that is not a spur type spur, gear. What was that? There's just one gear you said right off another one? Uh, uh, yes. Let's see. Hey, let me write this so I don't screw it up. Uh, unless the engine has a spur gear, um, or reduction is not a spur gear, uh, it is a minor repair. So it's a minor repair unless it has two things, which are internal supercharger, supercharger reduction gear that is not the spur type, and a spur type is just two gears. Like your camshaft and the idler next to it, those are spur gears. So even the Lycoming VO435s that have a gear system that usually takes it as in the back end because it runs a 90 degree drive and I don't know, it takes me a couple hours to set one up, minor repair. Uh, and then I did write recondition. Not an FA term. You call it what you want. That's what we call something. We disassemble, clean, inspect, and repaint and put back on. That's called recondition, recondition in my book. So recondition is the, whatever you want. Is the automobile equivalent of an overhaul. Mm -hmm. All right. It's, uh, abbreviations. TT. What was that about? Total time. Total time. We are required to keep track of total time on components such as engines, airframes, propellers, and the like. That is the absolute total time on it. So if I have an engine that goes all the way to a 2,000 hours and I did an overhaul, on a brand new engine, go to 2,000 hours, I overhaul it, put another 100 hours on it, I have 100 hours since... TVO. Major overhaul, but the total time is 2,100 hours. You got to keep running that forward. Uh, the manufacturer can grant a used engine zero total time. So if you call the factory and you say, I want a factory overhauled engine, 
I'm not sending you mine. I just want off-the-shelf factory overhauled engine. It will come to you and say this engine has zero hours. Zero hours. How many hours does the crankshaft have? I don't know. Could be twenty thousand. <laughs> it could be two. But because it's been remanded. But so they, so yeah. they will give you exactly what you asked for. So if you say I want a factory overhaul engine, they'll give you a factory overhaul engine with a whole bunch of old parts. Could be. Old parts. Um. I want to be careful I say this. It appears to me that Lycoming would give you a used case, I think a used <coughs> crankshaft in some cases, a new cam, new idler shafts, new idler gear, all new gears in the back end, um, new tappets. So it's like the only thing that I noticed that was probably used was the crank case and the crankshaft. And even that was questionable as whether or not they put a new crank in it. So. Will they give you new cylinders or will they just be new? Yeah. Okay. Nobody in their right mind would use the cylinders. <clears throat> Is that cheaper than getting just a brand new engine? Yeah. Yeah, it usually is. Sometimes not by a lot. You have to kind of look into it. I can't speak to what Continental's doing. Do they still manufacture engines new? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So, just because, so if you have a, like my engine is a 0470. U something something with the serial number is R something or another, which means remanufactured. So when the engine went on my airplane, it had zero total time. How much time does it really have on it? Sure, who friggin' knows? Huh? Seven. Could be seven, it could be 7,000. I didn't say seven or what? Alright. Um, all others, meaning mechanics, must carry forward uh, total time total time after overhaul so we as mechanics working out in the field either by ourselves or repair station we overhaul an engine you have zero time since major overhaul but the total time carries forward what if you put out a brand new crank every single part you bought new including the crankshaft and the crankcase you are not the manufacturer. So every single part, every single part on that engine is brand new, out of the bag. The only part that isn't is the data plate that went on it. The total time carries forward. Man, that, that data plate seems Let's just call it, uh, what was it, reconditioned? <laughs> Still got to carry the total time forward. Overhauled and reconditioned. All right, so A, B, C, D, E, uh, S, M, O, H. That is since major overhaul. And that you want to do. So every time I make a log entry, especially on an annual inspection, because if I was just changing the oil, I probably wouldn't go through all that effort. But definitely on an annual inspection, I'll have for the engine, the SMOH and the total time always listed. Um, I don't think I, I don't have this in my notes. Where do we get the time from? All right, so in my airplane, like a lot of airplanes, I have two devices. I have a tachometer, which tells me the RPM, which also keeps track of hours. And I have what we call a Hobbs meter, which keeps track of hours. Now the Hobbs meter, if you rent a plane, the Hobbs meter is attached to the battery switch. The minute you hit the battery switch on, it starts counting, whether you're sitting there or not. In a not rental plane, like my plane, you turn on the battery, and that instrument lights up, but the Hobbs meter will not move until there's oil pressure. So it's counting actual clock time of engine operating. Now on my tachometer, I have a digital one, uh, but it wouldn't matter. Tachometers are not designed to read accurately until they're up into the cruise RPM range. I think mine says right on it when every time I look at that, it says uh, tachometer is calibrated to read accurate at uh, 2250 RPM. So my tachometer reads really slow when I idle and my Hobbs doesn't. So which one would I use for tracking time? If you're smart, you use RPM. If you're smart, you'll use RPM. Why? Because it's registering slower. It's registering slower. Do I want time on my engine? No. 
All right, so the way I do it is I split it. I have a whiteboard on my wall in the hangar. I do oil changes that I want to do every 50 hours off of the hobs because it goes faster and I want good oil on my airplane. I don't want it, right? So I'm really counting that one. But when I log the time for the engine operation, I use tack time. Tack time. When I log my time as pilot in command, I use Hobbs. Hobbs. See, there's sometimes you want it to go faster and sometimes you want to go slower. You pick the right one. Mm -hmm. One of the few choices that nobody seems to mind. Yeah, you use what you want. Do you ever send your to analysis? I do every time. Yes, I do. Uh, all right, since so major. Um, TBO. Time between overhaul. Who sets that? Okay, set by manufacturer. Where does the manufacturer give me this information? Maintenance manual, overhaul manual, M0 manual, service bulletin, service instructions, some publication. Um, so, I was trying to think, I don't, it could be in the type certificate. I don't think it is. Do I have to follow it? No, if you're flying part 91. Part 91, the answer is? No. 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 For hire? Yes. yes. Um, TBO is often in both calendar and hours. So by date, because I always spell calendar wrong, or hours. Like for example, most engines say 12 years or, and they'll give you an hours, say 2,000 hours, whichever comes first. first. So if I don't have to comply in my airplane with the TBO, because mine is way past 12 uh, years, um, how do I know when to overhaul it? By condition. By condition, and we'll talk about condition. You should be keeping track, no matter who you are, I think you should be tracking your condition. When it quits. Yeah. On failure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> STOA. Nobody says that. STOH. Since top overhaul. Since top overhaul. Cylinders are considered expendable. They are not something that I said a minute ago, nobody in their right mind would reuse cylinders on an overhaul. I've overhauled cylinders and put them on engines for people who are really cash strapped. They're not going to go. I mean, it's illegal. It's 100% legal and it's 100% safe. It's just don't expect to go 2,000 hours on a set of cylinders and then another 2,000 hours. Not going to happen. But because they're expendable, a lot of times people will put on one new cylinder or all new cylinders. They'll get to a point where all the cylinders are giving them indications they're burning a lot of oil, the compression is low, uh, various reasons. They'll say, you know what, but my bottom end is still great. I've got great oil pressure, not making metal, no reason to do a major overhaul. Let's just take off the cylinders and bolt some new ones on. And so then they'll call that top overhaul, either new cylinders or have them overhauled. And let's say somebody did that. They bought brand new cylinders and this does happen. And then those cylinders are pretty strong. And for whatever reason, maybe mechanic did something wrong or just the way it is, the bottom end starts making a bunch of metal. Or some indication now that the bottom end got tired and they only have 100 hours in those cylinders. Well, they might want to take those cylinders off, overhaul them, and then put them on the new bottom end. And then, Or some people, some people do this. They'll buy brand new cylinders, they'll put them on, then they'll go for a while, then they'll take the cylinders off, set them aside, overhaul the bottom end, put the old cylinders back on. So they'll have older cylinders of the new bottom end, then they'll go for a while, then take off those cylinders, put on, you see, so they're always overhauling like half of it at a time. Would not recommend. And, uh, both top overhaul, do they change up the pistons? Yes, that's considered part of the top end, and it would depend upon what the manufacturer <coughs> wants. So if pistons are required under Service Bolton 240 for light combing or the M0 manual for Continental, then you can reuse if it allows it. I can't remember if it does or not. I think some, some do, some don't. And the connecting rods and the bottom end? Bottom end, yeah. Even the bushing at the top? The oh, you can't get that out. Let's take the whole rod off and overhaul the whole rod. 
So it's all part of the bottom so end. What about the piston pin? So then you, you can change piston pin. But if you do change out cylinders, all of them, then I would do a since top overhaul track. If you just did one or two, I wouldn't. It was, that's just a repair. Uh, let's see. There are times when we have to do a complete disassemble, clean, inspect, repair as necessary, and reassemble, but you don't have to test outside of an overhaul. And that would be the biggest one. Prop strike or sudden stoppage. When I first got in the industry, there uh, was no data from Lycoming or Continental on what to do should you have a prop strike. Prop strikes, if you hit a prop, um, whack something, there was no data on it. They didn't really, they were kind of silent on it. So what did we have to go to? 4313. 4313. A 4313 at that point, because there's a newer version now, said do a run out inspection to see if anything is bent. And if it's not bent, you may continue. And then Continental Lycoming, oh, people were pissed about this one, came out with a rule that said a prop strike is defined as, or sudden stoppage, and it was so many, stopping within so many blades. Uh, but the one I remember is if you had to remove the propeller and send it out for repair because you hit something, that is called a prop strike, which is a little harsh because you could hit a rock on the runway that puts a big chip in it and you want to take it off to have the chip fixed, then technically, is that a prop strike? Well, I guess it would be under that consideration, but that's not, I don't think, what the it's intent not, was. Right? No, it's not. The manual talks about hitting grass and stuff. Yeah, grass counts. Which is, but that's, is that also sudden stoppage? Yep. Yeah, if, if you read the service bulletin, and follow how fast it stopped. And there's reasons behind that we'll get into that I would consider that even though the prop wasn't damaged, it doesn't appear to be damaged, you start damaging other stuff in the, in the engine. So prop strike, um, let's see, definition by Service Bolton 533 Charlie. So this is um, definition according to Service Bulletin 533 Charlie is when I looked it up, could be Delta by now. Any incident, whether or not the engine is operating, where repair of the propeller is necessary, or by any incident during engine operation where the propeller has impact on a solid object. This incident includes propeller strikes against the ground. Although the propeller can continue to turn, damage to the engine can occur, possibly with progression to engine failure. Sudden stoppage drop on impact. Sudden, sudden, try it again. Sudden RPM drop on impact to water, tall grass, or similar yielding medium where propeller damage does not usually occur. All counts as prop strike. And so you must do what? Uh, I didn't tell you. For <laughs> what, water? And they mean water like a, like a standing body of water or rain? If you get enough rain to slow your engine down, I would consider oh, that. that. <laughs> <laughs> you said grass. I'm thinking grass. Yeah. Any, anything, anything that doesn't bend the prop that causes the RPM to slow down because you hit it. Pretty wide definition. So, I, I'm not going to write all that, but the definition's there. What do you have to do? Complete disassembly. Complete disassembly. When did they change this? Like, oh, relatively, like five, ten years ago? Or? 20. 20 years ago. <laughs> five to 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> now and when they first came out. I made a lot of, I, I, over, I overhauled. I did a ton of prop strikes. I mean, it was my bread and butter. Same guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his name was Tom. Yeah. <laughs> Over. How are you? Yeah. Um, let's see. Back then, Lycoming had you do a run out on the crankshaft, and if it was 0 0.018 bent, 0 0.018 or less, or it was not more than 0 0.18, whatever, um, be off by thousands you could have it reground straight. I think I told you this story, and this is how 
this was one of my biggest selling things for, for engines. And people would come to me and I would, you know, give them a tour of the shop, talk about overhauling the engine, kind of tell them what our base price were. Um, and then they would say, well, why would we, that's expensive. I did not expect it to be that much. For almost the same price, I can get a brand new one out of the or factory reman. Um, <clears throat> not a new one back then. It's factory reman for almost the same price. Why would I go with you? And then I would say, have you ever had a prop strike? No. Any major catastrophic damage to your engines you're aware of? No. Let me tell you about two guys. And I told you guys this story about the guys who went to Kenny Faith, didn't I? Yeah. yeah. Got a crankshaft. They brought it to me and it was oh, like .025 bent. And I red tagged it and handed it back to them. You know, I'm real sorry. Like, oh, don't worry about it. We just went down to, you know, Kenny Face. And we just picked one up. It's, you know, he's cool. We'll just take it back to him and we'll just get a different one. Right? Because, and, and uh, Kenny's kind of like that over there. I guess Kenny, it's, it's out there on, I don't know, that way. And uh, I think if you buy something, it's like a crankshaft. So, yeah, I have to have it checked for cracks. And it'd be, I think he gives you your money back if you bring it back cracked. It's like, no, nah, it was cracked. It was bad. Oh, yeah, all right, just take this one now. So I ah, would just go back to another one. Don't worry about it, Kevin. Then they were gone for a couple hours and they come back and give me the crankshaft. Try this one. And all the casting numbers were the same. And, and so I'm like, it's the same crankshaft. But I didn't say that. So I measured it and it was less than 0.018. And so I said, uh, <laughs> well, it passes now, but I know it's the same crankshaft. What'd you do? He goes, dude, anybody with a stump and a sledgehammer can straighten stuff. <laughs> So where did that crankshaft go? Not in their engine, but in a core that they sent back to the factory. Oh, there you go. So what's going to happen to this crankshaft that hits the factory that was within tolerance? Maybe the factory will scrap it. Maybe they'll fix it and put it in your engine. Is that the one you're, that's the one you're going to get? Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, we'll go with the overhaul. Well, now the factory does offer a your engine overhaul. Where you send them your engine and they'll overhaul that. This is break time, sorry, I went over a little bit.